The ICG is a community of independent market researchers who collaborate, share knowledge and experience to deliver value to fellow members and to clients. If you're an independent researcher and want to connect with over 400 like-minded people, gain access to our knowledge base, get inspiration, support and advice from other members, then why don't you join us? Either visit our website, theicg.co.uk forward slash join, or email us at membership at theicg.co.uk. If you're a client company and want to connect with the largest resource of expert independent researchers in the world with proven expertise across all markets, categories and techniques, then why don't you contact us? Either visit our website, theicg.co.uk forward slash connect, or email us, connect at theicg.co.uk. If you're a supplier and want to promote yourself to over 400 buyers of research services, then why don't you contact us? Either visit our website, theicg.co.uk forward slash advertise, or email us at admin at theicg.co.uk. The ICG, expert independent researchers. This webinar is kindly sponsored by Made in Studios. Following their success in Paris, Lille and Lyon, uh, Made in Studios opened their state-of-the-art viewing facilities in the heart of Birmingham in November last year. Since then, they've built a solid reputation and have received amazing feedback. The brand new studios are located only four minutes walk from Birmingham New Street, your direct link from London, Euston and Manchester, with over 2,400 square feet dedicated to market research. Their studios include one non-viewed studio, perfect for small groups and IDIs, and two large viewed studios, each with their own client's lounge. Additional services are also available, such as in-house streaming, focus vision, USB, and links for recordings, catering, and much more. Made in Studios are proud to provide recruitment services across all the UK, with a highly qualified panel of 150,000 double opt-in respondents all over throughout the country, they do all of their recruitment in-house and are able to reach the toughest targets at an affordable price. Made in Studios are available in France with viewing facilities in Lille, Paris and Lyon and recruitment services across the country. Hello everyone, my name is Tom Woodnut and I'm an ICG member of a few years now. Um, and in my time I've seen a fair few debates about issues to do with recruitment. So I'm excited to be able to share how we think Facebook can address them and help us find truly fresh and representative participants for every project. We're talking primarily about qual recruitment, but it also applies to quant sampling too. We believe this is important because your results can't be right if the recruitment is wrong. We believe the same pools of participants are being overfished. People are taking multiple surveys every week and the same people keep reappearing in group discussions over the months. And this creates two major problems. First, that some people will say whatever they can to get the bait. And secondly, that such frequent participation makes them less and less representative of a typical consumer. And I've spoken to psychologists about this issue and their view is that our experience of the past shapes our behavior in the future. So this suggests that regular participants will start to second guess the research process rather than share their natural spontaneous responses also, the way their and their others' contributions were received in past groups will have an influence on their subsequent behaviour in later groups. And over time, they can become a bit jaded, and the whole thing becomes more about the financial transaction rather than a genuine exchange of opinion. Given that representative participants are the lifeblood of the industry, this is a big issue that needs addressing. Hi everyone, I'm Hugh Carling, the founder of Live Minds, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak with you today. Now, recently we approached our own global network of qualitative researchers to learn more about their recruitment experiences. And some of the stories they shared were pretty shocking. There was the, the focus group for pregnant women, where the researcher discovered a participant was actually wearing a pillow under her gown. Then we heard about a female participant who turned up for focus groups on consecutive evenings returning the second evening disguised as someone else, wearing a wig, dark glasses and a hat. Then there was the bald man who turned up for a group about shampoo. And perhaps most alarming was this story from Italy. The researcher explained, A colleague started a focus group announcing, This is a group about cat food. 
you should all be cat owners. Everybody agreed. After a while, somebody from behind the mirror sent to tell her that the group was about dog food. She therefore started again, and all the respondents were magically transformed into dog food buyers. Now, the worrying thing is that most researchers seem to have experienced things like this before. Before going into detail on how Facebook addresses these issues and how we've been using it for recruitment, I just want to take a step back and look at the broader context of the challenges that we're facing as an industry. And for years, we've blissfully floated along, perhaps taking our status as clients' primary providers of insight for granted. However, recently, I've become increasingly concerned that this status is in danger. And this is for a number of reasons. First, there's our high-profile failure as an industry to predict big events like the US election and Brexit, which puts our credibility into question. Regardless of your views or involvement in predictive polling, I'm sure it's had a knock-on effect on the reputation of the industry. And this also relates to a wider flaw in our over-reliance on direct questioning and reluctance to fully embrace behavioral economics theory. The fact is, people cannot necessarily accurately tell you what they do or why they do it as much as we as an industry would like to believe. Secondly, the signs of a backlash against experts, which could leave researchers in the cold if more clients make more decisions without referring to our expert consumer insight. Then there's an ever-increasing number of behavioral data sets available to businesses telling them what people do without even having to ask them. And I also consult on social media content strategy and I've often heard clients question the value of paying thousands of pounds to ask people what they think, feel and do when they can get immediate data on their digital behaviours at the click of a button. So it's essential that we prove the value of primary research and show how it can reliably add value and insight to the behavioural data already available. And in the context of all these pressures, when it comes to primary research, it's more important than ever for us to cast our net in the right place so we have authentic, fresh and representative participants. We need to keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible in order to preserve our integrity. We think the advertising targeting functionality of Facebook enables to do, us to do this in a way that's never before been possible. So first Hugh's going to talk a bit about how their method works and then we'll share a few case studies with you from the work we've done together over the years. We call this service behavioural recruitment because it's powered by Facebook's unparalleled data and what people have actually done rather than what they say they've done. We use their hyper-targeted advertising platform in tandem with our own Facebook application to deliver this service. And we've successfully used this approach to recruit thousands of fresh participants of every age in more than 65 countries uh, for both qual and quant projects. There are now 2 billion Facebook users in 190 countries, and on average they spend 50 minutes every day on Facebook, reading and watching, sharing and commenting, liking and reacting, clicking and posting, and every single one of those behaviours goes into building their understanding of you. But it's not just what you do on Facebook. It's what we do on every single one of 10 million other websites that have these very familiar buttons. And this includes all of these very familiar brands, um, which happen to have many of the other most popular and engaging websites in the world. We don't even need to click this button. What we do throughout these sites improves Facebook's ability to service more relevant advertising. Now, in a recent study, Stanford professor Michael Kaczynski revealed that a computer model based simply on Facebook likes actually knew more about its subjects than their closest friends or family. But Facebook's knowledge of our behavior goes way, way beyond the like buttons that you click. On the Facebook platform itself, they're utilizing 98 different data points on their users, from our favorite football teams to our international traveling habits. So to us, it makes perfect sense um, that an industry dedicated to finding and talking to people who genuinely match specific criteria and want to talk about a particular subject should utilize such a hugely powerful technology. Especially when you consider that Facebook has a global reach that is 100 times bigger than the biggest panels. And the participants you find there are fresh to research, not semi-professionals who are conditioned by their regular participation. So how does behavioral recruitment work? Well, here's an overview of how we find the right people, engage with them, screen them, and then deliver the best ones for your research. Firstly, you share your recruitment criteria with us on a simple form. 
and we research the data using Facebook's Audience Insights tool uh, to give you a same day quote for any project. And we use that targeting based on demographics, interests and behaviours to reach the audience that we need to place our adverts. So in this simple example, um, we're going to show you, uh, we're going to show our post, sorry, to um, women in California aged between 30 and 40 um, that speak English and are interested in dark chocolate and are also early technology adopters. And that gives us 570,000 potential applicants. So we'll then create a range of different adverts which we place in the news feed of that hyper-targeted audience. And then we'll A-B test up to 50 different variations of these adverts to find the most effective message. People who are interested um, click the ads to go through to a landing page which gives them more detailed information about us and the project and so on. Then they go on to take the screener um, which sits inside our Facebook app um, ensuring minimal dropout along the way. And if it's a quant project, then they take the survey then and there inside of Facebook. In qual projects, if applicants pass the screener, then their responses are fed into our app, uh, where we'll review them and prioritize the best ones. We then check applicants' public Facebook profile to further validate their identity and their suitability. And finally, we contact the best ones by phone and invite them to take a qualification test. And this four-step screening process ensures that we get the best possible people for your research. There's no change to the process from a researcher's perspective. They give us a brief and we deliver the people. However, instead of needing a roster of suppliers in different cities and regions, countries or sectors, now they can have a single supplier who can deliver any consumer project around the world. So we're going to share a variety of case studies with you to show how this method can be applied in lots of different ways. And the first example is for a, a recent Qual project for Hyperloop One, uh, the company inspired by Elon Musk's technical vision to build 700 mile per hour floating trains. Now they asked us to find 40 affluent frequent travelers who were interested in the future of transportation, um, who regularly read and shared technology news and came from a range of uh, different um, dwellings, city, suburban, rural, and so on, as well as many other mixes. Now, Facebook is uniquely equipped to help us find these people as it tracks the location of its users whenever they log in, which, of course, they do a lot. And this means that you can directly target commuters with your ads as they know whose phone is moving from one location to another every day. And we're also able to utilize their knowledge of who's an early technology adopter and regularly reads tech news uh, to find the right people. In this example for BBC World News, they wanted to learn more about their audience in India to understand appetites for content and behaviour across different social platforms. Um, so applicants who met the criteria that we uh, put out and defined were invited to join a private Facebook group in which they shared and discussed content with each other. Uh, we then cherry-picked the most engaged and relevant participants and pulled them into a Live Minds online Quell platform where we spoke to them in more detail. And this was conducted in English. Uh, as well as Gujarati, so we had um, locally uh, fluent speakers uh, managing that project too. Now the next one was a, is a B2B quant piece, um, which was a, a very challenging request um, to find 300 vehicle fleet managers in five different markets. And not only did they have to have this fairly obscure job title, um, but they also needed to manage quite a large fleet. Um, they couldn't have used this global brand's fuel card um, and in fact, we were rejecting over 75% of all fleet manager applicants in the process. So we worked out that this had a, an incidence rate of 0.003%. Uh, of um, but we fulfilled this um, very difficult request within three weeks using a combination of Facebook um, and LinkedIn um, to target by job title, by location, um, by um, interest in relevant softwares and associations and so on. Uh, in this example, uh, for Sony, they wanted to evaluate the impact of their Facebook ad for their new headphones, uh, which was a video ad in, in, in Facebook. Um, they were concerned that panel providers would not be able to find a sufficient number of people who had been exposed to the campaign. And they also questioned whether people would actually accurately remember having seen the ad, if asked, uh, given how much false attribution takes place in these studies when it's just reliant on recall, which is obviously fallible. 
And through Facebook, we were able to target the survey at people who we knew had definitely viewed up to 90% uh, of the video ad. And so this was based on actual behavioral data rather than just claimed recall. And then in our analysis, we could see how factors like recall, demographics, interest in culture, competitor brands, and so on correlated with the campaign's KPIs. And so again, this humanized the behavioral data they already had on people um, and took it to a much, much deeper level. Um, and this example, we did a project for um, EasyJet in which we wanted to understand about brand preference and the customer journey. Um, and we wanted to speak to people that had just bought a ticket. Um, so we recruited people on that basis and we actually got them to share evidence of the fact they'd just bought their ticket with us. So we were completely confident that we had the right people. And then we did a mobile online qual study tracking their awareness of touch points um, and followed it up uh, with a qual online study as well to explore the decision making process and all the influences and, and more emotional dimensions of, of that journey. Now this one was for a little known osteoarthritis uh, treatment brand. Now it's often assumed that we wouldn't be able to find elderly people on Facebook, um, but actually there are over 150 million active users over the age of 55 around the world. And this core project required us to find 25 people in the UK aged between 50 and 65, all of whom had suffered from osteoarthritis and were lapsed users of this minor brand. Um, we calculated these people to have an incidence rate of about 0.3% versus the general population, um, but we found them within the space of a single weekend. In this example, for uh, the other end of the spectrum of age, uh, the Box Plus network wanted us to find uh, 16 to 24 year olds who were into their uh, niche channels such as Full Music, The Box, and Kerrang. Um, and they were concerned about whether you could actually find people like this um, through uh, panelists who are doing multiple surveys every week. They wondered if they were really truly representative of the pop music lover uh, that they wanted to understand. So we were able to target invitations at people that we knew had liked their pages in Facebook and that we knew were genuinely engaged in music video content because of the way they consume media on Facebook. Uh, and this formed part of a broader methodology in which we brought in a psychologist to identify the needs that music video addresses uh, and then to validate that through a survey with a thousand people delivered through Facebook. Uh, and we also preceded this with a, a piece of online qual and mobile um, qual uh, with 20 music video fans. Um, and, and that allowed us to, to, to help answer the question of why music video is so loved by millennials. Now at the moment, Facebook has an unparalleled global reach and by far the most engagement data on, on its users. However, undoubtedly new social networks will rise, uh, whether their success is focused on locations such as WeChat in China um, or around niche interests such as the Action Sports Network, Empora. Uh, but this methodology will apply as long as advertising content can be published to those members. We also see a big future in applying this to what we're calling flash research. And we see this as an alternative to MROX or market research online communities, which rely on keeping the same people engaged over time. Uh, flash research would mean running multiple fast turnaround quantum quell dips each time using fresh participants. So in a matter of hours, a client could have quantum quell data um, turned around really quickly. And this would cut out significant costs by reducing the need for expensive online community management software and resource. And it would also be more valid because people wouldn't be so sensitized to the process given that they're only used uh, once. Since our purpose as researchers is to get closer to what the right people really think, feel and do, recruitment powered by social media data is an important step in the right direction. And as the technology driving this approach gets ever more powerful and that data um, gets ever more comprehensive, um, so will our ability to quickly find the right participants for any project. And we believe that our industry will become stronger as a result. Now we're looking to speak with hundreds of researchers around the world to really understand and benchmark their views on the state of the global research recruitment industry. And we'll be sharing the results with all the participants and other industry members. And we'd love it if you take part by sharing your views in a short questionnaire, uh, which will be sent out with this video link over the next few days. Um, but obviously very keen to respond to your questions now too. And please do email me at hugh um, at livemines.com, that's H-U-G-H at livemines.com, um, if you have any questions or um, would like to participate. Now, the main thing that we're doing here um, 
uh, Hugh and Tom, is we're going to advertise. Advertising via Facebook is, is the, the method of contacting people. And you talked about A-B testing. And sometimes you said, well, we can have, have up to sort of 40 different executions. I think that's what you said. Can you just explain a bit more about how you develop yeah. your approach to advertising and, and so on? Could you just talk us through that a bit, please? Uh, well, through a lot of trial and error, um, I think it would be the, the, uh, the first, first point. Um, yeah, and for, for a long, long time, um, yeah, we got it wrong and it was very expensive and, and not particularly um, uh, effective for us. Um, so A-B testing is absolutely vital um, component of it. You can't just, you know, stick an advert on Facebook um, with sort of rough targeting and, and expect it to, um, to work immediately. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've have been involved in, in this, this kind of world for, I guess, sort of 10, 15 years, um, doing lots of um, digital marketing campaigns and so on. Um, so, yeah, was able to sort of draw on that experience. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's, there's several sort of components to a Facebook advert from the image, uh, the, the headline, the links, the detail in the bottom of it. Um, and we'll, we'll do kind of multivariate testing of each of those different elements for every project. Um, in order to to work out, you know, which is getting the the right people through at the end of it. Um, yeah. And from a researcher's point of view, um, there's been occasions where the brief has been, for example, um, it's been okay for participants to know that the client is, for example, for music. Um, and so in that case, the, the the invite came from from for music. But then there's been other occasions where we didn't want them to know who it was from. In which case, we've used generic uh, visuals, so we can chop and change between yeah. the to depending on what's appropriate. Yeah, I mean, 95% of the um, the recruitment that we do is is where the brand is not revealed. Um, you know, if you can reveal the brand, then it does make it slightly uh, more yeah more efficient from an advertising perspective. But you know, that's not um, how research is typically done. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've invested a lot of time and energy in um, you know building up our reviews on Facebook and and uh, refining the copy so that people feel that. Uh, uh, company and some that they can feel comfortable in, um, yeah, responding to and and uh, yeah, following through the ordered for it. Okay, um, I know that uh, obviously you offer this service and that's uh, and that's fine. Um, is there a light version? I mean, I know you've gone through an awful lot of work and effort and learning and you know success and failure and everything else. But is there a light version? Is is this that you think that that, that you know uh, one of us could just say, oh well, I'll put an ad out on Facebook and and try and make it work, or or what? What do you think? So I mean, there's two two sort of core parts to it, I guess. Well, maybe maybe three. Uh, one one is the advertising. Uh, the other is the the screening and the operational process behind that. Um, and then the third is is a kind of trust element. Um, and and having a sort of brand on Facebook that, that people feel comfortable with. So I mean, could could people who are watching this learn how to do it themselves? Uh, you know, absolutely. Um, it's not it's not straightforward, but it's doable. And there's you know a number of different um, you know learning resources out there um, to educate uh, oneself as to, to how to do um, Facebook advertising. Um, having said that, you then need to to apply that to the context of research and then to the context of, of each project. Um, so, so yeah, the advertising side, definitely the technology that we have makes the process much more efficient and being able to screen people in the application within the Facebook environment definitely reduces uh, you know, the, the friction a lot of people who are applying. Um, if you're sending people to a sort of external website with a uh, you know a survey posted on that website, then you will you know you will lose quite a lot of people in that process. Um, you know, can it still be uh, cost effective to do it yourself? Uh, you know, yes, it could be. Okay. So. Uh, um, I want and also. Sorry. Sorry, I, uh, sorry. I thought you'd stopped. As I say, the line keeps dropping from time to time, so uh, we'll persevere. Um, I want to cover off a few questions that have uh, come from our audience. Um, I've got a question from Martina 
Perisinotto. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Martina. Um, you mentioned this Facebook audience insight. Is that accessible to anyone? <laughs> Did you hear the question? Arthur. I had Facebook audience insights and nothing further. Okay. So uh, the question uh, is, is Facebook audience insights accessible to anyone? Yes. <laughs> um, I think you need. Yes, it is accessible to everyone. Um, I think you need to have what's called Facebook Business Manager set up, um, but that is free to um, that is free to um, to acquire um, if you apply for it. I don't think you need to be giving Facebook advertising money in order to, to have access to that. And it does give um, yeah amazing uh, information about um, well. Pretty much any subject matter that you could think about, um, you know, interests and behaviours and demographics all around the world, based on a sample of two billion people. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's an interesting thing to look at. Anyway, we won't go into that uh, anymore now. Um, now, uh, John Whiteley has asked the obvious question: How much does it cost? Can you give us any idea of comparative costs of using your system compared to traditional methods? Um, so it's it's pretty much in line with traditional methods in the UK, um, yeah. Where where the I guess cost savings become uh, more apparent is in international recruitment. Um, so you know typically we would say that a standard recruit um, and a, a complete within an online project or a focus group uh, would be fifty pounds. Um, for a, um, an international project it would be 70 pounds and that generally applies all around the world whether it's um, you know the US or Mexico or Vietnam or Australia or um, any other sort of non-English speaking market yeah and, and so that's finding people for any sort of activity um, it could be attending a an online focus group it could be taking part in an online survey it could be a whole range of different things but that's the sort of recruitment fee we're looking at exactly exactly yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not quant. Um, quant, you know, quant obviously would start um, at, a, at a lower price point. I mean, typically sort of five pounds and upwards, because um, most of the quant stuff that we do is is pretty specialist, where panels don't have the reach to find the the people that they need. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've got Cara Allen asking a question about, um, and I think there's another question that that, that Carol Wright Atara has asked, and I'll I'll sort of combine them together. Carol asks. Does Facebook have a specific um, opt-in uh, for the use of data in this way, or is it part of their general T's and C's? And Cara asks, how are behaviors such as, uh, for example, early adopters defined by Facebook? So tell us how Facebook knows all this stuff about us. Um, so the first question, um, so the the advertising targeting is based on, um, yeah, ex acceptance of Facebook standard terms and conditions. Any Facebook user, as I'm sure most people are aware, will see adverts serve which are relevant to them based on you know, their, their interests and behaviors. Um, so we then, before people are screened, um, we do um, get them to specifically um, agree to provide us with their name, their email address, and um, their public face Facebook profile, consent to access that. So this is actually um, some of the most simplistic um, acceptance um, of what we could ask for, um, yeah, based on all the, the Facebook the data, um, the data that Facebook has on them. Um, second part of your question, um, in terms of how they, can you repeat the second part? Uh, well, yeah, it's more to do with how do they, how do they know all this stuff? Because um, there's, there's how, how do they determine our behaviours? Because you mentioned early technology adopters, for example. I mean, how, how does Facebook know all that? Yeah. So, um, through this. So these 98 different data points should collect on, um, on all of its users. Um, these, these are, um, oh, sorry, you can't see my screen at the moment, can you? So, uh, but yeah, we, so things no, like no. Um, groups you've joined, uh, yeah, yeah, like the restaurants you've eaten at, uh, um, you know, whether you're in a relationship, what, what your location is, 
um, you know, the, the websites that you visit, um, the, the content that you consume, the things that you share, the things that you like, you know, a, a huge range of different um, behaviors goes into to building their, their profile of you, all of which, you know, is, is obviously Facebook's core engine for, for monetizing their platform. Um, and so they invest, you know, huge amounts of money in, in um, making that tr tracking and, uh, and use of it as effective as possible. Yeah. Okay, um, I've got a question here from uh, Rukmini Kamat, um, and again, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and this is to do because you mentioned that you have a Facebook page, and that sort of brand presence helps build your reputation, so that people realise that you're a bona fide organisation do, doing a you know a proper professional research activity. Uh, and he asks, how do you deal with yeah. poor reviews or complaints? From respondents, obviously, this may not have anything to do with you. It may be what happens downstream, but is that an issue for you? Um, fortunately, and I'm touching wood as I say this, uh, not not so far. Um, so I think we only have like four bad reviews on on Facebook. Oh. Um, all of which I feel are very very unjust, <laughs> as you would do. Um, so uh, yeah, a okay, couple well, of them. Yeah. A couple of them. In fact, I think. I've, yeah, it's, it's really like I've answered these questions, you know, even though we've told them three times in the process, this survey is just to find out whether you fit the criteria or not. Um, you know, some people don't read that, fill the questionnaire out, and then aren't selected. And they're like, but I've done this thing already, and now I deserve to be paid for it, and just haven't kind of comprehended exactly what, um, yeah, what the what the purpose of it was. So um, there, is a, there is a system for us to flag these things with, with Facebook. Um, if if they're inappropriate, or we can contact people and, and explain in greater detail, you know, uh, what happened and why, um, and, and hope that we can rationalise that with them. Yeah. Okay. I've got a question from Steve Taylor. Hi, Steve. Um, with a large quant study, are we able to screen out respondents that are over quota or, or do not meet the entry criteria? And he says, sorry if I missed it in the presentation, but are participants paid or compensated for taking part? And I guess that would be in this sort of screening exercise. Um, and if so, I imagine that Live Minds manages this. So, can you just explain the overquoting, the entry criteria, the incentivization to do these sort of screening surveys? I guess. Uh, yes. So, um, once we've hit various quotas, then the ad. Um, so, so yes, that is that is managed. Um, Yes, people are rewarded for um, the time in which they participate in the research project. You know, it's it's all pretty standard stuff in that respect. Um, you know, time is is still money um, in the in the views of, of most people, and we would insist that that people in projects that we're working on are fairly compensated for their for their time. You know, as with any other kind of research. So, so it could be a prize draw for Quan, or it could be a, a PayPal payment that that Live Minds do um, to the people that complete the qual. Yeah, I mean that is, uh, yeah, we use we use prize draws as a sort of primary reward mechanic for uh, for quant, and I have been very surprised at uh, how how effective that's that's proven um, yeah. for you know people who who don't know from Adam um, see the the invitation in the um, in their newsfeed and then then go to participate. Okay, um, I've got a question from Danny Sheehan. Hi, Danny. Um, hi, Tom and Hugh. Thanks for the presentation. For consumer research, do clients ever have concerns about respondents? With a Facebook presence being different from those who are not on Facebook, and how to address these concerns, I imagine that for older respondents, clients might perceive Facebook active people as being more tech-friendly, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is a sort of education job to do with with some clients, um, but you know, ultimately, in the UK, by way of example, um, there are 37 million Facebook users in this country. So you know that is a colossal proportion of um, yeah of, of the population. You know, way way bigger than than any other sort of database or lists of uh, potential research recruiters. So so yes, there is some degree of bias, but I would argue it's you know fractional compared to um, you know alternatives. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a few more questions just to bring us up to uh, our finish time. So we're, we're doing okay for time, even though we had those delays. Uh, this is from Kate Slater. Given the varying nature of costs to advertise to different audiences on, audiences on Facebook, um, 
essentially what we'd, we would call IR, so uh, um, incidence rate, I guess. How do you cost it to clients? Is it cheaper than traditional recruiters, mm -hmm. more expensive? So, and I know that we've had a conversation about this before, Hugh. I mean, how on earth do you manage to get the costings, well, I suppose, right, really, when, when you're looking at audiences that um, can, can be of quite varying incidence rates? Um, so, well, we use tools like Audience Insights to evaluate the size of the audience. Um, we can also look at um, the, the CPM, uh, the, the cost to advertise effectively, which, um, which Facebook predicts when you um, give it a sort of test advert to, to run. Um, and there's a kind of equation based on you know, audience size, the number of mixes that, that we have, um, and the, the cost of advertising that we use to, to feed into our um, yeah, feed into our pricing. And if clients can provide incidence rates, if it's their own customers and they've got that data, then that's something that we'd share with Live Minds and they can factor that in and get an even more accurate prediction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I mean, it's not, it's, not yet a perfect, it's not yet a perfect science and it's something that we're, you know, building data on the whole time to, uh, to make it so. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Julian uh, Bridgewater asks, how do Live Minds handle all the language requirements, telephone follow-up, etc., when recruiting complex B2B samples, and I suppose he means international as well. So how, because how, you mentioned using the phone to do a sort of final verification of people. Um, how do you manage the sort of international dimension of that? Yeah, so we have what we call our local support network, which are you know people in um, specific locations who, in, in typically for face-to-face -face research, they would do the final kind of five percent of calling them, introducing themselves, answering any questions the participants has, and so on. Um, in, in truth, we used to do that for um, online qual as well, and and now we do the qualification process um, online because you know that's the environment in which people are, are going to be. Um, articulating themselves, expressing themselves, and you know, demonstrating their their abilities, um, and yeah, so and that and that works um, works just as well, to be honest. So yeah, we do have um, we do have a, a sort of local presence, but um, but yeah, the, the vast majority of it is done through um, you know translation network we have here, and essentially replicating the same uh, core method and tech, um, but in different languages. Okay, I've got a, uh, five more questions, so if you could uh, give me a sort of 10, 15 second response to each so we can, uh, uh, can try and tie these up. Uh, Jeff Dayton, hi Jeff. Um, can you ask if they cope with client mandated adverse events requirements in pharmaceutical for consumers um, and HCP uh, CP, such as neurology? So you're probably aware that within pharmaceutical research there is, there is often a requirement. To, uh, to have an adverse uh, event reporting system. Is that something you, you've worked on, come across? Uh, um, it's not, it's something that we're keen to start doing because actually for medical conditions, Facebook has an unbelievable amount of knowledge of, of uh, you know, where these people are and how to find them. Um, but yeah, live minds as yet don't. And if okay, you're talking well, about the recruitment stage of it, then at that, sorry, yeah, let's get the 15 seconds thing covered, go on. If you want to hit this with the next one. Well, I think Jeff can probably contact you. In other words, it's an open door, so Jeff can contact you directly, I'm sure. Now, the wonderfully named Signum Gogus has asked a question. Uh, I hope I pronounced that Signum correctly. Uh, what does this mean for traditional panel and recruiters? Will all eventually go through this type of online recruitment? So let's look at your crystal ball, guys. It's, it's an interesting one because their whole business is set up um, in, in this older model of, of panel based so it's not really in their interest to, to make the switch. Some people um, like Taluna are offering uh, to top up through Facebook recruitment but I've not heard that it's been a particularly major thrust of their investment so um, I think they'll just carry on coexisting in parallel as, as it you know you still have Catty, you still have face to face quant and so I think there'll be a parallel existence but I'm sure social will just get bigger and bigger as a recruitment method. Yeah okay I've got an, another question from uh, Carol Wright at our, um, what do you think uh, in, uh, of the profile of the people who do not use Facebook much or at all? So this is the, in other words, not the 35 million, it's the rest. So, so that chunk of people, um, and I guess it comes back to this representativeness, do you know much about them? I mean, in that, in that scenario, it might be that you'd want to still use traditional recruiters and find people that aren't 
that actively aren't on Facebook. Obviously, Facebook is not good for finding those people. So you just need to supplement that part of the sample with with a traditional method. Yeah, I would say that of that 37 million who have an account, um, it's somewhere in the region of 30 million use it at least once a month. Um, and on average, as, as I mentioned, people use it 50 minutes a day. Yeah. Okay. A um, couple more questions. James Diggle has asked, uh, what strike rate do they typically expect when advertising for respondents? I appreciate it probably varies. I'm sure it does. But let's say a thousand people live in a town and we ask you to recruit only people living there. Uh, any idea? If you just tar target people, I guess let's talk, talk about just ordinary citizens. In order to qualify, you just need to be a citizen of that town. Any idea what sort of strike rate you might get? Um, it, to be honest, it does vary too much from project to project to sort of pin a number on it, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay, okay. And then this is a f final follow-up. No, 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 no. <laughs> I know it's a brief answer. Um, final follow-up question uh, from Steve Taylor. Um, saying clearly they screen up front, but what about screening out or going over quota in the survey once they've begun? Uh, sorry to follow up, just need to distinguish between their screening and more complex screening within the main interview. Um, so I suppose that means that you know, you're know you recruiting people at one level of screening and then there's another level of screening once it goes into whatever the survey is. Um, and I suppose the, the argument would be, what about those people who drop out? I mean, maybe that's just a, a conversation you'd need to have directly with Steve or anyone else with the same issue, I, unless you have a 10 second answer to that. Not totally sure I understand it, to be honest. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we find people based on you know their behaviors in Facebook and then we screen them using, I mean, effectively a completely standard online screening um, tool within our Facebook app um, and then have other layers beyond that, as, as we mentioned. So, so yeah, please do, do follow up and I'd be happy to chat it through with you.